y'all want to hear a crazy story? So if you ask average Joe Schmo off the street when the first submarines were created, he might say, oh, I don't know, the 50s? The nuclear era. That's a reasonable guess, right? If you're somewhat more worldly or well-informed than that, well, maybe you'd know that submarines were absolutely in widespread use in World Wars II and even I. The German U-boats infamously sinking the passenger liner the Lusitania. But surely that's got to be it, right? It's got to be right around then. After all, that would make a lot of sense. You know, the internal combustion engine and electricity both coming into fairly widespread use just a short time before then. And it would seem that both of these would be fairly obvious prerequisites to safely sending a vessel underwater. Well, my fellow humans, I am here to tell you that you have wildly misrepresented the uh, ingenuity and frankly utter lunacy of certain members of your species. I'm here to tell you the story of the first submarine to ever sink an enemy vessel. This is the story of the CSS H.L. Hunley. It is late in the American Civil War, the 17th of February, 1864. The Union Navy is blockading the harbor of Charleston, South Carolina, and one part of that blockade is the USS Housatonic. A 1,260-ton sloop of war equipped with 12 cannons and staffed by 150 men, commanded by Captain Charles Pickering. It's getting on to 9 p.m., and as far as the men on the deck of the Housatonic are concerned, all is quiet. That is, until something emerges from under the water. Would these men have even had the words to describe what it was they were seeing? Perhaps it looked to them like a locomotive steam engine coming at them, but with a big lance on the front of it as if it were a knight going into a joust. This locomotive slash jousting knight is in fact the CSS H.L. Hunley, the mission of which on this evening is to sink the USS Housatonic. The Hunley has snuck up so well on the Housatonic that it can't mount a broadside defense and can only fire upon the submarine with very useless small arms. The jousting lance part of the locomotive is in fact what's called a spar torpedo and that is exactly as old-timey, 18th century ridiculous as it sounds. It is a tor torpedo built for ramming speed. You would attach it to the front of your ship and just sail on up and ram the hell out of the ship that you were trying to sink. The barbs on the torpedo head would keep it firmly in place while you sailed away screaming, See ya suckers! The Hunley landed a direct hit. Bang. On the money. The men of the Housatonic loaded into lifeboats well before the ship even sank. Five died in the attack, so most of them made it out, but the ship was done for. The mission in that sense was a total success. But perhaps a locomotive slash jousting knight isn't really the best metaphor. Perhaps a big metal bee is a better comparison, because once the Hunley had laid down its sting, it was not long for this world and would sink shortly after. Reports conflict as to exactly what happened next. It is most likely that the Hunley was incapacitated by the shockwave from the torpedo that it had planted into the hull of the Housatonic. For a long time, evidence suggested that it lasted about an hour after the successful attack. Now this seems unlikely to me, as the Hunley was discovered in 1995, in only 30 feet of water by the way, and it was raised up in 2000, and the remains of the men were found at their posts. There is no evidence that they had tried to escape. The current prevailing theory is that the torpedo went off faster than expected, and the shockwave ruptured blood vessels in the men's lungs, killing some of them instantly and at least incapacitating the rest. It was found just 20 feet from where the Housatonic would have been, so that theory strikes me as the most likely. But whatever the timeline, the Confederate submarine did sink after its one and only mission, killing all eight men aboard. So that's insane to think about, right? Like the first time an enemy vessel was sunk by a submarine was 1864. I would have predicted like 80 years after that. Like when pop culture was Elvis Presley, not Camp Town Races. We should probably talk a little bit about how we got to this moment. Now the idea of a workable submarine goes back to at least the 16th century. And of course, Da Vinci famously conceived of a flying machine that would work under manpower, so the idea of such things goes back considerably before that. In the middle 18th century, we have all kinds of patents being filed for various submersible components, and in 1775, we see the American Turtle, a one-man submersible craft which the Americans attempted to use to attach explosives to British ships, and every single attempt failed. Now, while the turtle failed in its combat role, it did succeed in that it's the first underwater craft that we can absolutely verify that it was functional. My dudes, I mean, can you even imagine George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and powdered wigs and Ichabod Crane and the Headless Horseman in a working submarine? 
Like, which of these things is not quite like the other? Like, we started out talking about submarines when pop culture was Elvis Presley, and now we're talking about them when pop culture was Beethoven. Tell me what you think the average person would say if I told them that there was a working submarine, true or false, when Napoleon was a kindergartner. Enter Horace Lawson Hunley. He was born in Tennessee, but the family relocated to Louisiana, where Horace would become a lawyer and state congressman. He later went into naval engineering in one of those old-timey, your barber is also your dentist sort of career changes, and began developing submarines with one James McClintock and one Baxter Watson, who is somehow not a Ninja Turtles villain and was actually a real guy. Now, it should be noted that the Union were working on developing submersibles at the exact same time, so it wasn't as if this was some cockamamie, pie-in-the-sky Looney Tunes plan. But in another way, as we'll see, it really actually kind of was. The first submarine they built was called the Pioneer, but the problem is there is a war going on and the Union kind of came over and retook New Orleans, forcing them to scuttle the Pioneer to keep it from falling into Union hands. Side note, I straight up adore this detail, by the way. Like, they were so enamored with their death trap, horrible technology thing that probably isn't going to work, that they were just like, this is our trump card. This thing is a WMD. We cannot allow this to fall into the hands of the Union. Maybe they were concerned about their patents, but I prefer to think that they had cracked the code and won the war themselves, and they absolutely could not allow this to fall into Blue's hands. Then the three businessmen try to build another one, but this one sinks in the harbor outside Mobile, Alabama. McClintock and Watson decide they are done with the submarine business, but not our man Hunley. This dude is Thomas Edison with a light bulb. He will not accept failure. So he funds a third submarine himself. This new 40-foot vessel launches in July 1863, and it's shipped by rail from Mobile to Charleston. At the time, they were calling her the Fish Boat, or the Fish Torpedo, or the Porpoise. And on the 29th of August, they do a test run. And five men die on the maiden voyage. That probably might have been a good time to call it a career, to uh, get out of the submarine business for Hunley. But whatever madness compelled the early cosmonauts in the Soviet Union also possessed one Horace Hunley. Not only does he keep on, he insists on joining the next test run himself. And on the 15th of October, 1863, the fish torpedo porpoise boat sets sail once again, its builder on board. And it sank again, killing everyone on board, Hunley included. This was the moment when they realized submarine warfare had not caught up to current technology. And it was probably not terribly practical to think that this current technology could be effective in that era's version of warfare. Nah, I'm just kidding, they raised it again. The creator of the thing went down with a ship and died in the last test run. And they were like, YOLO, good enough for us. 19th century, dude, I don't know. Three months later, it would sail into history, taking down the Housatonic but sacrificing itself and all eight men aboard in the process. So, you might be wondering, how did this thing actually work? Don't worry, it won't take me very long to tell you. We're in the era of steam-powered trains, so that seems likely, right? It probably ran off steam. Well, they tried that, and then they abandoned it. In favor of a crank! Yes, that's right. This thing was powered by seven guys turning a crank, which turned a single screw. The eighth guy, the commander, was in charge of their depth and steering. I confess myself a little torn on this. Like, part of me is impressed with the ingenuity and simplicity, and part of me is embarrassed to be a member of the same species who thought this was a good idea. But yeah, that's how it worked. It sounds ridiculous even as I describe it, but that's how it worked. As I said before, the Hunley was raised in 2000, and these days it is a major tourist attraction in Charleston, South Carolina. You can go tour it. I've never been there myself, but hey, it's on my list. This has been Long History Short. I am the world-renowned historian. Be good, kiddos. I am out. Hey y'all, thanks for watching this video. If you'd like to see another video of mine, it'll be right there. Bam! If you want to sub to this channel, that'd be super awesome. Be right there. Bam! It's that little circle with the like white letters WRH with kind of like a stylized picture of my face under it. In a black circle. Yeah. So, anyway, you'll notice that I'm talking about the Confederacy in this video. And I didn't do one of those disclaimers that, that his history YouTubers always do where you gotta be like, By the way... I know they supported some really evil things, but I don't support those things. 
Anytime you're talking about the Nazis, you got to say that. You're talking about the Confederacy, you got to say that. I didn't do that because I know that the people that watch my videos are smart enough to know that I'm just talking about history right now. And I'm talking about people. And obviously, I don't support any of those things. So I just wanted to thank you all for being smart enough to know that I don't support those things so I don't have to do some dumb disclaimer about how I don't. Appreciate you all. Love you all. Thanks for watching. WRH. Be good, kiddos. Peace out. Till next time.